There we go. So I wanted to start with just quick introduction to the folks on the panel, um, and then uh, have a little bit of conversation, but hopefully kind of drawing us all in. We're, we're not a huge group. Uh, some of us had remote work experience before three weeks ago. Uh, some of us are a little newer to it, and I think, but it's clearly kind of a weird time to be working remote, even if you're fairly used to it. Uh, and so I, I think kind of an open flowing conversation about what's working, what's not, and what are some things that people are trying to make this successful uh, would be helpful, I think, both to us and hopefully to an audience uh, beyond the crew. Uh, So I'm just going to go around and do quick introductions by the folks who agreed to be on the panel, uh, and we'll go from there. So Chris, do you want to start? Sure. Uh, I'm an engineering manager at MindGrub, which actually isn't in South Carolina at all. Uh, I used to work remote uh, in South Carolina. I've since given it up, work primarily out of an office at, out of the Baltimore area. Um, but conveniently enough, I have a lot of experience working remote and had uh, been in charge of the remote committee at MindGrub's office for ramping up and shifting us to a more remote-centric culture before COVID-19 showed up uh, last November in China. So uh, I've really kind of transitioned into uh, taking a year's worth of plans of rolling things out slowly and truncating and forcing those out the door over the course of two to three weeks and watching how effective those plans have been. I also do some Drupal development occasionally. Will? Hello, uh, my name is Will Jackson. I am a um, Drupal developer with Canopy Studios. I've been working uh, remote as a Drupal developer since about 2012. Um, so the working remote is, um, is it's been pretty, pretty common or pretty uh, routine for me anyway for uh, quite some time. Uh, definitely had to make some transitions, um, you know, with the whole COVID outbreak. Uh, but um, overall, uh, I think I got a, got a lot of experience just working remote. So, yeah, pass it over to next one. Oliver. Hey, uh, I'm Oliver Seldman. I'm a uh, customer success manager at uh, Pantheon. Uh, formerly. Uh, working at agencies as a like a tech lead kind of role uh, for a number of years. Uh, and before that, as a contract developer, um, uh, I've worked with Kaylin and uh, we kind of were going through similar bits of this presentation uh, a couple weeks ago. And I came to realize that I have been working from home for 19 years. Um, I, um, since about 2001, uh, I have been working as a remote contractor uh, with a couple minor exceptions, um, uh, either yeah, as a contractor or as a remote employee for uh, for quite a while, apparently. <laughs> um, and so uh, I've definitely uh, learned a few things along the way, um, mostly just how to survive. Uh, but uh, uh, but yeah, that's me. Uh, and. I'm Aaron Crosman. I work uh, with Attain as a senior consultant there uh, within the Salesforce Services Group. I do Drupal to Salesforce integrations when I get to play with Salesforce these or with Drupal these days. I spend much of my time in, in the Salesforce world, um, and uh, I have been working remotely off and on for about seven or eight years now, uh, but. Uh, full-time remote uh, the last, uh, just the last two years or so. Um, I had a kind of stint in between where I was uh, sometimes remote and sometimes in an office and uh, splitting it that way. Uh, I just wanted to start by giving everybody a, on the panel a chance to talk about kind of what's the, the one biggest thing that they feel is needed to be successful, particularly in this uh, moment with uh, COVID-19 and finding the right balance of working remote and dealing with the challenges that are around us. Um, if folks could talk a little bit about kind of what the one biggest thing they're feeling like everybody should know right now. 
Uh, and we can go the reverse order we just went if folks don't mind. So if Oliver, if you're up for going first. Sure. Um, so uh, I, I would say, I mean, so the, the biggest thing that, that so working from home for, for so long, uh, um, that part was, was no change. I mean, there's literally nothing different about that element of it. Uh, so for me, the biggest change is my kids being home from school and not only being around, but also uh, needing attention, needing not, not only just attention, but like, you know, having a teacher. <laughs> and so uh, my wife also works full time uh, and mostly from home uh, before as well. So um, that that has been the biggest change in our uh in our day to day um, since this happened, and uh, so the biggest the biggest thing it, for me has been uh, just ha uh, working on really kind of intentionally integrating them into into the day to day, um, setting boundaries with them, uh, setting boundaries with work. Um, uh, the keys there are you know about communication and. Uh, probably like kind of constant adapting, I guess, because it, 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 it seems like, you know, what we thought was going to work in the first two weeks is a lot different <laughs> than what we have now. And their school is changing and they're adapting to how they're, you know, being more uh, online uh, with their schooling. Uh, so it, it's like a constant um, resetting of boundaries and expectations and uh, just knowing that they're, uh, that all the stresses that it's bringing to us, you know, there's an unsettled unsettledness with them as well. Um, that that uh, is is worth uh, paying attention to. I think that's the biggest challenge I'm facing now. I don't have, I don't have a good answer for it, other than to point out how challenging it is. Bill, you want to go? Yeah. Um... Yeah, uh, kind of echoing really what Oliver was saying. Now, I have I have a smaller child. Uh, he's, um, I mean, less than a year old. So that's I don't have so much uh, as far as like with the school, but um, still trying to you know balance that you know work life uh, balance, but also you know staying accountable too because you know is kind of as Oliver mentioned this this is this is the same sort of, um, or I mean the workload that I did, you know, prior to COVID similar to now. Um, and, you know, still trying to stay accountable for the, um, you know, things that we're doing the, the uh, work. So, uh, what I found myself doing kind of initially was, um, you know, as all the, you know, the, the news and everything's coming out of the, all of the uh, details and numbers, you know, just, just, I mean, with the economy and everything, just trying to, um, keep that and I guess keep that, um, kind of, I guess, desire, I guess, because I always want to just know where everything is at in the world and kind of what uh, is going on. So uh, trying to just not become distracted with a lot of the um, kind of the overwhelming news that we have uh, today is a big thing. Um, but yeah, even just kind of the day to day, just trying to, you know, keep on top of the work and um, just trying to be able to uh, deliver as much as possible has really kind of helped me to just try to, um, I guess, kind of keep that sense of normalcy. Uh, so, I mean, just trying to uh, not be distracted by uh, the news, the um, <clears throat> just kind of a lot of the negativity and things that's out there. Um, so just trying to make, make the best of it. That's the big thing. Um, I don't know, Aaron, have you, have you uh, an experience with that? Just trying to stay away from Facebook and you know, all the news sites and stuff. I mean, I think that's kind of a, a trick. And I think even before this too, I mean, it was kind of always a thing if I'm waiting for like a circle CI job to build or something and I've got a few minutes, you know, pulling up a news site or something, but I just seem to find myself doing that a lot more. Uh, a lot more I, I definitely think, yeah, some of that uh, uh, being mindful of, yeah, how much time you go suck down the rabbit holes. Uh, of some of this stuff is uh, yeah. is important right now. Chris, do you have something you wanna? Uh, I can tack on a little bit of that. I definitely can empathize with the news rabbit hole. Um, I know I've done that a lot. I've had, in talking with a lot of engineers, some are uh, kind of more sensitive to the situation than others. Uh, I think one of the biggest things for me in keeping in mind um, 
with this current remote situation is uh, there's very, very much a difference between opting and choosing to ro work remote and having that experience and being forced into working remote. And I think that's something we've consciously tried to work with people of a lot of people have lost the control of whether they're working in the office or not anymore um, and kind of walking them through being as successful as they can in that. Um, so we, of course, like there's kind of leveling of expectations. We understand the world's a chaotic, stressful place. We are emphasizing that as much as possible, um, doing the small bit we can to reassure. Um, I think it was just in a really fortunate situation. So we're able to at least assure our employees like, hey, your job's here. We're in a really good position. We have been preparing for an economic downturn. So we're just, we're in a good spot. Don't worry about this. It's one less stress you have to worry about. Um, a lot of that, it's, then it's been taking and um, working with people about how they communicate, um, thinking about people that have worked in an office their whole lives. Uh, we have a little over 100 people that work out of our office, and um, there's been some practices we've built up, like, hey, I have headphones on. If you see me with headphones on, do not talk to me. I'm in the train of thought, and you will ruin it. You'll, you'll, you'll ruin at least an hour or two of my day if you tap me on the shoulder. Uh, another big one we have is just, hey, if, if I'm not in my desk, it's be if I'm not at my desk, it's because I'm either hiding, trying to get work done for the day because there's deadlines and I don't have time to hop in a quick meeting with you and I like, not being heads down will distract me. Um, a lot of that we've trained people uh, are trying to like train people to adjust and Kind of outward communicate that through stack set slack statuses or just their busy notifications and then also on the other side of that getting a lot of our non-production team members that are constantly looking for answers just to be respectful and kind of respect these new boundaries that we've set with our, our production folks or any, really anybody on the team that needs to go heads down um the one other thing again with the communication it's it's our entire stance has been to remain um with, uh, remain and keep a high level of empathy for everyone. So there's also an open door policy of like right now, if you need to step away, if you need a mental break and everybody's kind of maybe aggressively asking people if they need a break, if they're comfortable and also respecting that. I think a lot of on both sides of the equation has just been setting each individual's um, expectations around what will make them happy, comfortable and successful through this duration. It's, it's really interesting. I mean, communication is kind of an obvious one that's always a hot topic with uh, remote employees. You know, don't, don't go radio silent. Please put your work in. But this was a bit of a shift of a lot of folks that didn't want to be remote that have been forced in and lost that control into this new remote culture. And it's also different in the fact, um, uh, on top of communication, we're really kind of manufacturing a lot of uh, social interactions through work, non-production related, because as a remote engineer, I was real quick, and I know when I worked in the area, I was happy to go and run to lunch with Will or Aaron or good Lord, I'd run to lunch with anybody just, you know, to go see people occasionally. Uh, we also don't have that option, so we've been working through a whole slew of options based off people's interests to make sure that not only you're communicating, but like you have some form of human interaction on a regular basis. As much as possible as we can through uh, work at least. Yeah, I would the thing that I've been finding, you know, helpful has been that, that patience both with yourselves and with each other that finding ways to, to take time and to recognize that even those of us who had routines are having them be disrupted, that there are other aspects of life that are crowding in um, and you know, even my dogs are more disruptive than normal because just because we're they're out of their normal routine. Um, and definitely folks who have, you know, children, we're seeing a lot more, you know, my, my team is really experienced at doing this, but we're seeing a lot more people's children's popping job, popping into the background a lot more, you know, I, you know, I, you can't be in here while I'm on with the client. Shoop, shoop, shoop. Um, that's normally, you know, everybody has that down. Their children all know that but they're having trouble tracking it because things are so out of sorts all the way around. I think the other thing my sister actually reminded me of over the weekend is, you know, there's all these people talking about getting stuff done and learning new skills and all kinds of stuff. And it's one of those, like, as somebody who was already full-time, I don't really have that much extra time. Like I go grocery shopping less. 
you know, I, I don't, I don't go out as much on the weekends. I'm doing more of my yard projects, but it's not like I have oodles of time where I used to be busy with something else where I'm down. And even people who had commutes, you know, you, you're taking time about taking out a commute uh, at most. Uh, even if it's a substantial one, that's not a huge amount of time. And my sister was reminding us that, you know, the things that we didn't want to do before all this started, we probably still don't want to do now. If you had messy closets, they're probably still messy. They're probably going to stay that way because you probably still don't want to clean your closet. Uh, and that doesn't make you a lazy, bad person. Uh, it just makes us all who we are. Uh, and that's just kind of what's going on. Um, and being patient with one another about that. Um, I had a similar reaction to that because like, uh, it, it, I mean, it, I have way less time than I did before. And like, it's not only like that, uh, oh, I'm not seeing all this extra time that like, it's, it's actively harder for me because now I have all the things that I was doing plus, you know, six hours of school to maintain with my kids and no outlets for them to go have their after school activities and no outlets for them to have their play dates. And so like, I, I'm like kind of resentful <laughs> in a certain way. I mean, getting over the resentfulness, but like, I, like I want to binge watch some stuff on Netflix, but I have no time. I have way less time than I did before. Um, so yeah, uh, that, that one was like, it, it took me a little while to, to not be, not be pissed off at people for, for enjoying themselves on their break, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Yeah, and I think it's also as people have shifted from a mindset of we're in this for a couple of weeks, right? I mean, that first when it all started, everybody's like, we're closing for two weeks. And I remember getting really strong pushback from a friend of mine who was on a board of a school. And when they closed for two weeks, I was like, you're not closing for two weeks. Nothing in two weeks is going to cause you to reopen your school. You are closing for months. He's like, no, no, no you know, this is the incubation period, we've done all the research, like the research you have is using crap data. And, the, you know, yes, it's the best data we have, but it's garbage and nothing about this is gonna be over in two weeks. You're closing for months, but they just couldn't be in that mindset. Um, now that school is closed to, for the rest of the school year. Um, and it took them a while to process. I think a lot of people when we first started working, or when they first started working at home were like, it's just to the end of April or it's just to the end, you know, it's just to, till tax day. It's like, now, nah, it's gonna be here. We're gonna be here doing this for a while. We aren't, uh, this isn't a short-term disruption. And I have a short-term, you know, a long-term disruption who hangs out in my office with his squeaky toys. Um, <laughs> I've definitely found that like, that element of it has, has translated pretty nicely to, because everybody has some version of this happening that like the the general idea that being on a call with a, a customer and having my kid come in the room or my dog barking and jumping up on my lap or whatever is i i already was finding that people were much more receptive to that and then in fact it humanizes us in a way that uh creates a meaningful connection with them um and i was already trying to use that not like not intentionally pulling my kid in to be part of my presentations or anything, but like when it happened, like kind of rolling with it and having my uh, confidence and comfortableness with the situation translate to, to, you know, to my interactions with the customers. And I'm now more than ever, I'm finding that they are re receptive to that and, and that it, in fact, it kind of builds a, builds a rapport that, uh, could, you really can't create otherwise um, something that you know communicating over uh, zoom call video calls is hard to is hard to uh, um, hard to build sometimes that you, when you're not you know in in person meeting with people or at a conference or in a meeting room with them I was actually almost awesomely on cue Come on, let's check this out <laughs> could not be better hey uh, so I'm on a call and these are my two kids we just tie-dyed a shirt. Oh, nice. Hey, these guys just tie-dyed a shirt. Check it out. Um, so Here you go. Put that on the balcony because it gets a lot of sun. Uh, and it'll dry fast. Yeah, go for it. And, and you said you weren't learning any new skills in your spare time. 
Oh my God, this, <laughs> it, this could not have been better timing, right? I mean, uh, all right. <laughs> Are there other things people want to suggest in terms of strategies that are working well for them uh, and helping them adapt to what's going on? Either members of the panel or other folks who have thoughts to suggest? Um, I mean, to build on the idea of communication, we've um, mostly, uh, I mean, I have very little control of anything that happens at MindGov, but I've tried to um, build a kind of more transparency that was in, pl in place before with uh, my teams and my engineers, um, you know, with what's going on. Uh, beyond like what's going on with my life personally, what's going on with their life. Uh, I am very interested in kind of non-standard issues they may be having. Uh, a great example, uh, one of uh, one of my engineers never would have said anything and we had a long conversation and I found out she's absolutely miserable because she has no office furniture. She's been working in like an antique wooden chair at a folding table at her at, at home that it's weird. She never thought it was an issue for any of us to be concerned about, but it, that's an easy problem to solve um, to like make people more comfortable. I think we've, as much as possible, kind of opened up from the top down to be more transparent as well. As well as like, hey, this is, you know, it's not a mystery. This is where your company is. This is where the state of Maryland, as far as information we have is. And um, at the moment, we've kind of opened that up into the form of daily and weekly reports, just as, hey, this is where we are. And we're trying to encourage um, kind of at an individual level to put that information back up, you know, let, let people know if there's anything going on. Uh, I had one engineer that just leveled with me and said he was unbelievably stressed and couldn't get away from the news cycle and like ended up taking a couple of days off just to de-stress and, and relax. Um, I think, again, it just, uh, because people are not willingly in this conversation, in this situation, um, we've really been trying to peel back and add way more transparency than we would have in the past. Um, it, in our typical day to day, it, no, no one really cares about what MindGrub's like sales pipeline is, or what kind of chair people are sitting in, or whether they uh, have horrible posture every time we see each other. Like no one usually cares, but. Uh, trying to open that up to make sure everyone's as, as comfortable and successful as possible. I, one of the things I would extend that a little bit is, well, I think it's really important from kind of a, a governance and, and leadership position for companies to be open from top down. I think there's also a, a real, a real out reality that not only were people forced to work remote, but managers are now being forced to, re to manage remote. And that's, you know, as somebody who's made that transition, that can, that's hard. There's a, there's a skill set there. There's a set of experiences that come with doing the role that way. And a lot of managers are, who are people who didn't want to manage a remote team. They wanted to manage a team they could actually see. Uh, and they know how to build rapport through friendly chit chat in the office or going to lunch. And they don't know how to build rapport and maintain a team remotely and, and finding ways to be thoughtful, particularly for those managers you know to be uncomfortable about kind of being proactive with communicating to the manager that you're there. Um, just that sense that, that basic kind of sense that you're, uh, you know, a lot of managers fear that like, how do I know they're not working if I can't see, or how they're working if I can't see them? And I don't, that's not a great management strategy, but for a lot of people, that's where their manager is right now. And just acknowledging that and kind of uh, being supportive of checking in first thing in the morning and checking out when you leave and not like punching a clock, but giving some sense of opening and closure to the day so that they feel like Aaron appeared. They're not shocked that Aaron disappeared, that there's that kind of consistency going on. We definitely, I, I agree with that. Um, I think on a specific example, um, I on a regular cadence and I had to very quickly transition from an in-office uh, managerial role uh, to a remote role, as well as the rest of my team who again, wasn't willingly um, being remote. Uh, you know, it's, I have, I have calendar invites just because I tend to get busy, but I have calendar invites set regular, 
regular intervals where I'll check in with my team members, not about how their work's doing, but just them as a human being. Um, you know, how are they doing? How's their home situation? You know, I, at this point, have built enough rapport. Usually I'll ask about their personal interest or their personal life. Again, just making sure they're as comfortable and happy as possible, and we'll have some back and forth like that. Um, I found that's worked really well for me is I, I tend to either use a lot of Google Hangout or, or Google Calendar, uh, just to-dos for myself, or I'll, um, in Slack, there's a remind command. I use that a lot to, hey, just privately say hi to this person, or um, on going the other direction, I will also check in with some of my team managers, um, just to, again, check in, see how they're doing, let them know how I'm doing, um, set regular cadence. I know we've got a, not that there's any direct responsibility, but we've got a handful of team members that work odd hours because they have children at home now. Um, so oftentimes I'll have reminders to just check in with them when I know that they're there and I'm still at my computer. Usually we'll check about something not really company or work related, but again, just kind of regular iteral check-ins. Um, I found that that works really well for me. Um, along with that, to give another specific example, um, I, I work really well on this idea of like, maybe it's more complicated than it should be, but this idea of like uh, half-life decay for communication on tasks and projects. Uh, and what, I mean, if I get a large task that I think is going to take a week, um, when, when half of a week is up, I will check in with everyone that's involved with that particular task or project, let them know, hey, this is where I'm at, or you know, where are you at with the work that you're expecting? Uh, I kind of just dial that down. So it's half a week and then half of a half a week, I'll check in. So like another day and a half or two days, I'll again, just touch base and, hey, how's everyone doing? What's everyone going? And I'll report back like, this is what I have. So there's not that radio silence and it's this very loose system of um, checking in and communicating back and forth with team members. I'll do that for tasks as well as like projects that are assigned. So if I'm on a project that's supposed to take three months, again, a month and a half, I'll make sure just to specifically reach out to everyone involved if there's not already, already a regular cadence of, hey, this is where we're at. Something simple like, hey, how's everyone doing? How's, they feel? how's everyone feel? We're halfway through the time budget now. Do we feel like we're anywhere close to halfway of the amount of work? Uh, what's going on? Let's talk about it. And just setting those kind of regular systems in place, I think I found a bit really beneficial through this kind of chaotic situation as it's a, a system for communication I can fall back on that doesn't require a lot of thought to uh, initiate reaching out to people. Chris, you had something to add to that too, um, in lines of communication. Uh, one of the things that um, we started doing at Canopy, and actually it's mostly just the owner, uh, the CEO of Canopy, uh, she's been doing daily videos. Uh, so it's kind of like just a quick status update. Initially, it was it was definitely more, you know, I guess a direct response to, um, you know, COVID and just kind of what's going on, general status of the company, you know, kind of, you know, overview stuff like that. But um, as you can imagine, you know, after a few days or weeks, you know, that's kind of gone down. Uh, so it's mostly just like, hey, how's it going? This is what's going on. But yeah, having that constant communication, it's just really good for, um, I mean, just morale. I mean, just you know, kind of knowing, feeling confident in that, you know, we're in a good place. We're going to get through it, you know, and that's, that's been uh, tremendous, uh, tremendously helpful. Um, I mean, I mean, they're like a minute long and it's just kind of, you know, showing the dogs or something, but just kind of like chatting, you know, but yeah, I mean, having that communication, even if it's, you know, seemingly not really good or a, a chunk of information that's being transferred. I mean, it's still good. I mean, just touching in and, and you know, having a communication, I mean, it helps everybody. I'm going to jump in from the audience and, and uh -oh. add to one of, one of the things that's been interesting for me is talking with coworkers and even my manager, you know, when you, everyone always does the quick, like, Hey, how are you? And everyone goes, Oh, I'm good. How are you? And I kind of stopped and I was like, no, really, how are you? Like, nobody's really good right now. So, like, how are you actually? And so, like, there's a couple of people that I was mentoring who are newer to the company that I still check in with on a regular basis. And I'm like, how are things actually going? How is your extended family doing? Like, one of the people on our team, um, his dad has a confirmed diagnosis of COVID. So, I check in every couple of days. How's your dad doing? How's his wife doing? They think she has it too. Like, what's going on? And, like, actually, like, giving them a chance to be like, yeah, this really sucks. I can't go help them. Like those kinds of things and getting those fears out. And it's, it's helped him a lot. But I think like basically 
taking that moment to just like poke that knee jerk reaction of, yeah, I'm good, has been really good for getting people to be a little bit more comfortable because it's like, yeah, it's my coworkers. I don't want to tell them that my life is crazy right now, but everybody's life is crazy right now. So like, let's just acknowledge that and move on. That's one of the things some of the folks on the, this call know that I've spent a little more time on Slack the last couple of weeks checking in with a wider variety of people than, you know, there, there's some folks I just kind of chat with every couple of days or once a week anyway, but I've been making a real intentional effort to broaden that, that circle. Um, Cause I recognized, I got a, a text a couple of days ago from a friend of mine, you know, it was just a, a childhood friend who I haven't heard from probably directly, you know, outside of like Facebook, public Facebook uh, wall post back and forth in probably four or five years. And I kind of was, had that, that own, my own mental track of like, oh, that was really nice. Like it was really nice just to hear from Morgan for no other reason than to say hi for the first time in a really long time. Um, and so that's kind of helped me remember to to reach out beyond just my normal circle of of friends, but to push that audience a little further out and say, hey, how how are other folks doing? And making sure they're getting check-ins, particularly people I know don't necessarily get it within their team at work that friend not all teams do that well uh, and pushing a little further out to uh, broaden that conversation a bit. Um, I will say some of what I'm finding is the basics though largely still apply that finding a routine that people who don't have workspaces like Chris was describing, like that still matters, um, you know, having a an end to your day so you don't work all night long or through the weekend like my my brother-in-law's company they were a largely remote team and they got to the first weekend and they just all kept right on working because there was nothing in their life to mark the weekend they just and they got about a week and a half in and they were like just ready to kill each other and one of their one of their managers was like okay no one works this weekend which is a rather anathema, like that kind of hard line on, on weekend work was totally out of character for their company. Uh, they all, you know, through the weekend, they all been like, yeah, we're just gonna all keep working. And then they got to the next weekend, they're like, nope, no, you're not. <laughs> Everybody shut down, go away, chill out. Um, because we have to maintain some of that balance. We have to get ourselves those spaces. Um, and while any long standing kind of advice on remote work carries most of that stuff. I think a lot of people were tempted to just be like, this is a weird and different time. So none of the normal rules apply. And it's like, well, no, the rules apply. Some of them have to be aspirational at the moment because it's going to be hard to have a good workspace. It's going to be hard to adjust to a bunch of things. Um, you know, it's going to be hard to have all the tooling in place for a company that didn't plan ahead. They're going to be backfilling. But you still need good remote work collaboration tools. You still need a good workspace. You still need a good routine. Um, and if the first routine doesn't work, you're going to need to keep trying and iterating over your routine until you find one. That's what I found throughout this whole thing. I've always wanted to do like remote work. Uh, and during this whole thing, I found out how wholly I'm unprepared to do it. <laughs> I've kind of hit the ground running with remote work. And a lot of things you guys talked about touched on that. Like, um, morale from Will's uh, talk, um, you know, workspace from your talk. Um, yeah, it, it's just so many different things. And I haven't had a chance to reach out to some people, or really many people, because I'm dealing with a lot of things on my own, being unprepared and just everything else. Sorry, did I interrupt? I, I just thought I was good. No, we want people to jump into the conversation. You're always welcome, man. But um, yeah, just I'm, I'm learning as I go along with the remote stuff and asking different people here and there, seeing things I like and seeing things I don't like. <laughs> um, I was one of those people that uh, identify with when you said, um, you know, I build rapport through conversations, face to face, going to lunch. 
uh, I was kind of like erred on the side of walking to people's desks uh, as opposed to slacking them or anything like that. So this has been kind of uh, more challenging for me to feel morale. Sometimes I'm like, should I reach out to that person right now? They might be busy as hell too. I'm, I'm not sure. And when they're, you know, during the other flip side, sometimes I get too many requests and trying to balance all those at the same time. It's uh, on the remote, it's kind of challenging, but it's, it's so far so good. Other the folks who are adjusting have thoughts to share, either things that are working well or things that have gone totally sideways or feedback they'd be interested in, in getting? It has completely ruined one of our company issues for the year to have less meetings. We went from, there's never a conference room, but we're really spending way too much money burning through talking to each other in meetings all day long to, hey, let's chat. Hey, let's chat. Hey, do you have a minute to chat? Yeah, our, our company started doing uh, like these intentional random hangouts. They uh, created a, 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 like there's a kind of a Slack bot for, uh, matching people to have a, a random weekly check-in um, where basically you join a common channel and then every, uh, well, I guess it's going to come out a little bit later uh, at the end of the day today. Uh, at the end of the day on Monday, uh, it randomly pairs, or I don't know what logic it uses to pair two people and uh, suggest that they uh, find it. Then it looks at both of your calendars, finds three times where you have overlapping and makes a couple suggestions. And the idea is to just like not talk about work and just, as you said, like maybe finding times to have more meetings that are, um, you know, ways of, of connecting in a, in, in a scenario where uh, we've, we've been kind of pulled apart from, from that, uh, the regular cadence of our, of our connections. Uh, which well, is I think they should do during company time, though, because if you have like kids and stuff, um, you know what you would be doing after work would be considered after work activities too, right? Yeah, this is on company time. Oh, okay. Well, you're not in South Carolina. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I forgot to say that during my intro that I'm actually based in Los Angeles. Uh, I'm on. Oh. I'm on Pacific time. Awesome. I missed that intro anyway. I'm sorry about that. Yeah, no worries. No worries. I just shared a link to that app too in the Zoom chat if oh, anybody's cool. interested in it. it. It is pretty cool. How's that been working for you guys from, from you know, the anecdotal evidence of the two of you? I, I enjoyed David's it. David's in here too. He, yeah, I think David, he's, he's I been participating. Um. <laughs> oh. Last week, I got to talk to our head of IT and somebody from one of the engineering squads that I didn't know. And I was like, yeah, I never would have talked to you guys if this thing hadn't paired us up. So we, we got to be, there was an odd number of people. So we got to be the lucky group of three last week. Oh, nice. Friends. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't know that was the thing. Um, I randomly I've had two HR people <laughs> that I've met with, <laughs> but I had never really talked to them, you know, other than like where we're interviewing this person for this role or whatever. So it was nice to like connect on a human level. Um, and I, I suspect as it goes on longer, um, it will, it will, it will keep kind of uh, returning dividends. I think also people are, uh, are taking the initiative. So there was like, uh, uh, a pet hangout uh, last Friday where for an hour. It's like everybody with pets just hop on and introduce their pets to one another. And uh, people are doing like morning tea or coffee breaks. Like, hey, I'm, you know, having a, I'm having coffee from, you know, nine to 10 on the Zoom. Just hop in if you want to say hi and we can whatever. And uh, Kaylin set up a, like a co-working session for, for our team on a weekly basis. So there's just like a, a couple spots during the week. I think it's just one hour this week. Uh, these I believe at least all that idea from David too, for the record, um, is on this call. Uh, just finding ways to uh, be present with one another outside of like a specific meeting with a specific purpose, um, with a needed outcome. 
uh, which is are also important to, to to do, obviously, in these moments. But uh, it's nice to have that extra connection when we when we don't. And that, that kind of dovetails nicely with what you were saying about reaching out to old friends and stuff. But like, um, that, I think that works. Uh, that works both ways. Yeah, I was, I've been thinking about some of these projects, where particularly the kind of the large companies that that are geographically diverse, even if they're not work remote or work from home where the, the teams are spread through multiple offices, that some of these efforts around getting people together in some level of cross-functional gathering, whether it's some pseudo random or somewhat random like the, the stuff Pantheon's doing or some of the folks where it's like, have a common interest or you work on a common technology, but not on the same team. Um, some of the things that companies are doing, I think are probably actually a good idea in general, that they're being forced to be creative in this moment because everything else is broken uh, for, for those kinds of uh, getting to know you exercises. But like I think about the company I work with, we've got offices in like 40 states. I have met very few of those people um, and working on, and, and where I have met people outside the team I work with, they've, some of them have been tremendously important, just like getting, you know, starts as a random, hey, this is Kristen, and now Kristen is a, you know, a, a, a senior manager, and, uh, you know, when I needed to help run down finding some person to help me with a project, she was like, oh yeah, you, you want to talk to this guy, like, and here we can get, get him some hours off of his, available so he can help you solve this problem, and as well as like, had no way to know who to call for some of these kind of, for kind of a random esoteric question, but knowing the right person to ask led me that hop. And I only met them because I'd met them at a social function. Uh, and so coming up with ways to broaden those connections and improve the web uh, of, of social network, of uh, personal networking across these companies, I think is really long-term healthy and valuable um, for the company. And, there's some, usually some selling that has to go on to get folks to see that long-term value of, yeah, you're spending hours now that don't come across as, as financially productive, but in the long run, these are the kinds of things that build you a stronger set of connections within the company and help with retention and help with productivity and um, just make it a better environment to work in. Uh, people get along better. Uh, but you do have to actually be kind of intentional about building it. Uh, the very first yeah. place. Sorry, go ahead, Kayla. Oh, no, go ahead. Keep, Ed, go ahead. I said the very first place I worked, when I first became a remote worker, I was working for a large nonprofit, and I thought it was a big deal to become remote, but we were a, a geographically diverse organization, so it didn't occur to me until I was remote for a couple of weeks that we actually had a really remote culture in the company or in the organization, it was just nobody thought about it that way because everybody worked in an office. But I started my, it became a home office to me. And, you know, I got an IP phone because we had a traditional phone system there. And then I had people who didn't know I'd moved to South Carolina from Philadelphia for months. They were like, hey, can I just pop by your desk real quick? And I was like, um, no, I'm not here. Like, I'm not where you think I am. I, I'm, you're welcome to come by, but it, it's a, a 12 hour drive, um, mm -hmm. up a three story walk you're thinking you're taking. Um, but stop by my desk and say hi to Lucy. Um, you know, she has my desk now. And there was that kind of stuff that but we already had a lot of that process in place that was really useful to have just uh, those kind of social functions. Uh, but we didn't recognize it till much, much later. I think one of the interesting things that we've seen um, at Pantheon is we we also had that similar multiple offices. I think like half of the company is remote anyway. So we have a lot of people who are already remote who aren't facing a change right now. Um, but, you know, for, for as awesome as Pantheon's remote experience is, there were still certain things that were difficult, like communication outward from the main hub. 
just because you have a lot of people centralized in one location, you know, a lot of the decision makers who are talking and they're talking to each other and then people who are in the office just hear that stuff and it doesn't really get intentionally communicated outwards. And it's been really interesting listening to said decision makers discussing in meetings where they're like, I don't know what's going on. Like, I can't just talk to people. I'm not just overhearing things. Like, this is crazy. And we're all going, yes, please remember this in four months when you're back in the office. And, you know, they're they're starting to kind of get a feel. You know, I remember um, Niall, who's our chief operations officer, made the comment. He was like, I don't know how you people sit and stare into a webcam all day. You know, having, you know, this is how your meetings are. It's not in person. It's not. And it's just kind of like, yeah, working remote seems like it's really awesome, but there's definitely some challenges to it that you guys just didn't understand, and now you're starting to. And and it's, I, I hope that they remember after this experience, but it is leading to, I think, we've I've seen three or four, like, end-of-week email bulletins now that are coming out from different departments that's like, hey, this is what happened in our department this week that you might want to know about, which didn't exist before. You know, they've just started in the last month and like I hope that they keep going but it's it's been really fascinating seeing those like final little cracks in the remote experience starting to get fixed which is really neat. I think it's really hard for organizations to learn that piece of the like to some extent you have to stop acting even if you still have a headquarters and there's really good reasons to have a headquarters you have to at some extent stop acting like you have one um, for a large event, particularly for for internal communication at large events. That, um, one of the things I remember we learned when I was at AFSC was how useful it was to, sure, you wanted to gather people for some of the big, you know, all hands meetings, but we started to do things like have the executive director who was in Philadelphia not be in the room with everybody else in Philadelphia. And not as an elitist, like, I'm not coming out of my office, but more in the mode of the people in Philadelphia do not get a benefit of having her right there. She's in, she is remote to this meeting. And so all of us trying to engage with her, were having the same uh, barrier that we didn't have the advantage of like, pick me, pick me, pick me, uh, that we all had to get routed through the same queue and the same process so that there was a, a more equitable balance to the communication. Um, and it worked well for some things um, to, to kind of create those artificial barriers so that you rebalanced the, the power dynamic. Um, and just being thoughtful that there's a power dynamic and thinking it through and being mindful of it um, and not pretending like, what? We're all, right, we all get along, we're all egalitarian, yeah, we've got a hierarchy of chain of, chain of command and that's all there is. Um, of like, nope, there's a, there's a real clear power dynamic when you can have that informal chit chat in the hallway um, that bypasses a lot of organizational hierarchies and, and whatnot. So we're coming up on, on the hour here and we usually try to run the presentation about an hour. Um, I'm happy to keep going, but I'm also trying to be mindful of that everybody should have an end to their day. Uh, for those of us here on the East Coast, we are a little past our, our typical ends of our days. Uh, Will uh, sent his apologies earlier. His, his day needed to end. He, his son needed a bath, so he's off doing that with Max. Um, are there closing thoughts anybody has, particularly folks who haven't had a chance to jump in the conversation? Is there anything you guys want to share as we start to wind down? Uh, my name is Doran Goodyear. I just wanted to say hi. Uh, I got reference to this group as a, you know a thing that exists. I actually live in Atlanta, but I'm from Philly originally. Um, so I'll be paying attention to the meetup schedules and uh, showing my face. So thank you. Nice to meet you all. Thanks for coming. We're over. Some of us are in Georgia too. I'm in the Augusta area. So I'm in. Yeah, I'm uh, inside the perimeter in Atlanta. So oh, nice. Okay. Yeah, we we head over to the Drupal camp there. Actually, a lot of us do on a regular basis. So, yeah, 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 awesome. I was just about to ask how many uh, South Carolina Carolinians are still in this meetup. Uh, uh, today, yeah. two. I think Three? Ty. Oh, and Mauricio. Ty, yeah, I was like, Ty, are you actually in South Carolina still? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's it. 
Chris is honorary South Carolina. Carolina. I think. Still oh, family. I am. I am. I miss it. Well, I don't <laughs> miss the yellow snow you guys are going through right now. It's mostly bad. Oh, my God. It's everywhere. It's atrocious. <laughs> it's so much better than it was. I have washed the back porch, and I am back to being able to breathe on my back porch. How's everyone's uh, locations uh, where they're at? Um, how are their local areas uh, handling this whole, uh, or just kind of like the general feel of the area? I know some areas are more serious than others right now. There's a lot of idiots where I live. <laughs> oh, that's not yep. unique to you. <laughs> I'm experiencing that uh, quite a bit as well. <laughs> I live near downtown LA, so um, oh um, man, I get to I get to see a lot of it. A I, lot of uh, the serious only time in your life you can actually drive the loop in LA. Yeah, <laughs> traffic here is fantastic right now, <laughs> and in fact, uh, it's like got some of the best air in the country. Apparently, I was gonna say I've seen that <laughs> the air quality has been cramping up. It's so crazy. Uh, but yeah, no, uh, I feel like there's there's definitely like a portion of the city that has taken this very seriously and is approaching it methodically and listening to suggestions. And then there's just a big part of it that is just doing whatever they wanted to do. Uh, it's like the, the, and like my block is like a nice microcosm of all of that, where like we have people who are, you know, being very conscientious and then up the street, like yesterday I was walking my dog and there was like 10 guys hanging out, having a party, drinking beers, <laughs> smoking cigarettes, chilling, just like as if it was, you know, a regular Sunday afternoon. Uh, so, yeah, I don't know. So Aiken is pretty well calmed down. There's still a lot of people driving when you go out. But I actually think people made, there's a lot of people just out cruising. Um, because if you go anywhere, there's no one there. Uh, and there's not a lot of places to go right now. Although I will say the, the, re the rec center in my neighborhood has been struggling with the, uh, they keep trying to keep it closed. The teenagers are really determined, um, particularly the teenagers that show up in pairs. Uh, social distancing is very hard when you're 16 and in love. Um, and uh, there's been a bit of, of watching, this, you know, kind of see who's wandering through the beach. Uh, and then when the, uh, the guy who's, you know, looks out for it comes around, you can see him coming up the like, yep. Then all, they all go scurrying off into other directions. But it, uh, for the most part, I mean, we go out and get takeout and groceries about once a week for each of those, a little less than once a week for each of those. And, um, we are we have not gone anywhere near Home Depot, but that's apparently the the last big place people are shopping and struggling with the social dis distancing thing. And at last check, they're still not doing anything to enforce the the current oh. round. I now they that may have changed in the last couple of days, but I haven't seen any markers it's that they're probably coming. Out. But with with ours, and it wasn't a Maryland thing with ours. With Lowe's and Home Depot, they only let 10 people in the store at a time. Uh, as of last weekend, everybody we talked to, or like, I guess we, last we heard was like Friday and Saturday. I don't know what Sunday, Easter may have been slow, but mm -hmm. Friday and Saturday with the gorgeous weather here, people were just, all the reports we were getting of like, yeah, people are still going, nobody's wearing masks. Staff haven't been provided masks. Um, but most of the other businesses are doing better. Lowe's maybe doing that. Oh, that was specifically Home Depot. I'm learning how to sew. So that, that's, a, that's <laughs> awesome. a, a new skill. My, my wife is already a skilled at using the sewing machine, but I've been uh, making masks for ourselves and for friends and stuff. Definitely was not something I, uh, I don't think I've sewn stuff in, since I was a kid and was like hanging out with my mom and stuff. But uh I definitely I uh, my machine two weekends ago and discovered that we'd lost the power cord. Oh, turns out that's a really critical piece. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> and it's kind of expensive on my mother's 1960s, 1970 era machine. 
for a machine yeah. that I'm not really sure it actually will work when I plug it in. So I hand stitched a, a half a dozen masks. <laughs> the last oh, that I would vicious. offer to let you borrow my portable sewing machine, but you know, <laughs> I'm not coming. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> but stay away, plague bringer. Yeah, so we've we've been dropping some groceries off for friends, particularly some 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 of our senior citizen friends. We've been picking up a little extra while we're at and out and, and dropping them on their porch. And you know, now it's nice to ring the doorbell and run. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're being conscientious. <laughs> yeah. I mean, to be fair, if teenagers were routinely knocking on my door, leaving a bottle of wine and chocolate and running away, I could work with that. I would be okay with that. You know, there are worse things they could choose to do. I, I saw somebody, I can't, I can't remember there was somebody that actually did this in our neighborhood or that they just shared in the neighborhood group, but somebody got TP'd and egged. And somebody just dropped like a pack of toilet paper and a you know crate of eggs on the, the front porch, rang the doorbell and ran and just said, you've been TP'd. And I was like, okay, that's adorable. <laughs> I assume the worst the moment you said it, I was like, what? No, what they were just, they were being really sweet. It was, <laughs> it was kind of adorable. The grown up version of vandalizing, vandalizing your neighbors. <laughs> that's actually been one of the things that's been really cool in our neighborhood. Um, people have barely been kind of banding together to do neat things for like the kids and stuff. So like they organized a bear hunt. So people were putting stuffed animal bears in the windows and people could go walk around. And then they did an Easter egg hunt. That was a similar idea. Only they were like doing chalk Easter eggs on driveways and on sides of trees and, and whatnot. And um, just like a whole lot of that kind of stuff like somebody somebody I think is working on a scavenger hunt to have kids like take clues um, to go be able to walk around with their parents and find like things that are interesting to people's lawns based on like their riddles and stuff. So it's, it's pretty neat. Yeah, we've been, uh, we've been doing that uh, with, uh, with the kids. We, uh, and I could certainly share the list that we came up with. We uh, found some online and we came up with ourselves, but we did basically like do a, uh, our daily or daily-ish walk uh, with a scavenger hunt sheet with all the types of things that you might find on a regular walk and maybe some of them a little bit more difficult or crude than, <laughs> than uh, you know, to keep the kids entertained. Um, and definitely actually uh, included the kids in the process of creating the options for the, for the scavenger hunt so that they kind of had some buy-in. Um, it was just really fun to like, um, go around the neighborhood trying to find stuff. And there definitely have been people putting stuff up in windows uh, for, for other people to see. Actually, we went by our friend's house, one of our neighbor's house, and they had a rainbow in the window. And uh, I asked what the rainbow was for. And the dad was like, I don't know, I don't know but <laughs> I think it's just it's to there. put a rainbow in the window. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> but it, it was good. I was like, the kids were interested and we were pointing out and talking about stuff as we went by, so. That's awesome. Folks are starting to, to drop off. I'm gonna go ahead and end the recording. Uh